Okay, so good morning, everybody. My name is Carla Valdovin. I work at Astronauts Policy Officer for LOFAR together with Rene. I'm very happy to be here today to talk a bit about LOFAR, its organization, and its future prospects. So Rene already told you um, about the instrument and the amazing science capabilities that LOFAR has. So I would start, would like to start by bringing you now a bit down to earth and explaining to you how a country can actually obtain a LOFAR station. So there are three entities that are involved in the process of getting a station. The first one is AstroTech Holding, which is a subsidiary commercial company from Astron that deals with contracting. So basically the sales contract from the station, the station delivery and also the warranty of the station are deal with AstroTech. We have Astron, that is the National Institute for Radio Astronomy in the Netherlands, that is involved in the whole process. Astron developed LOFAR, the LOFAR instrument. It continues uh, working on it continuously uh, in the upgrade that we are facing at the moment. Uh, so Astron provides project management and support to the buyers of the station in the whole process that go from getting the hardware to chipping it and to rolling out in the, in the, st in the, in the place where the station is going to build. Astron is also involved in uh, system integration and verification and also to provide the rollout management. And finally, the station validation and commissioning. So when the station is built, then there is the third entity that comes to play, which is the International Lofar Telescope, uh, which uh, we have the director sitting here. Uh, the ILT deals with the membership, with the operations of the network, but also with support and with maintenance uh, support. So how do you build the installation process and the building process? So there are many steps. I'm not going to go into the details, but it's just to give an idea. So first, there needs to be a survey of the site. So the potential site that has been identified to build the station needs to be surveyed. So people from Astron uh, engineers will come and will do some testing and see that the conditions, required conditions are met. Once the site has been access, accepted, so there needs to be some work on the terrain. So it has to have certain conditions, like a certain profile has to be very flat. Um, then we go to the station design. So finally, how are the antennas are going to be laid out, which uh, direction, inclination, and so forth. And finally, there is the rollout process, which includes the assembly of the stations, the installations, and the final verification. So if all of this, that I think it takes about maybe two to three months, the whole process, if everything goes well, at the end, you will go through an acceptance, uh, site acceptance test. So the pictures here uh, show the latest addition to the network, which is the station LB614 in Irbene in Latvia, that last August uh, successfully passed the acceptance test. That means that the station fulfill all the technical requirements to allow it to work um, within the network. So here we see the director of the Ventspil University for Applied Science that is signing the acceptance test together with the engineer from Astron. Well, so now you have your station, it's working, it can be connected, it can work in the network, and then the country that owns the station needs to enter into the collaboration. So it, this is the International LOFAR Telescope. It is a foundation under Dutch law. It was established in 2010. The participants are the national consortia of countries that have stations connected to the network. There is also an important participation from Astrom. Um, it has two main bodies, which is the board. So all the members of the collaboration participate in the highest uh, decision-making uh, process, which through the board. And also uh, there is the director that actually uh, uh, applies all the decisions and policies that are uh, decided by the board. The central operations uh, are done by Astron. So Astron is the operational organization, it's a statutory uh, decided this way. The participants in the collaboration remain the owners or th of the resources, but they contribute them to the central operations. The requirements to enter into the IT are to have a unified consortium, to 
uh, bundle all the interests of the scientific community in the different countries. So there is only one voice per country, let's say. And the requirement is also to have at least one low-far operational station that is dedicated to the network for 90% of the time, and the remaining 10% of the time can be used in private, uh, for private use. Uh, and finally, there is a contribution, an annual contribution to the central operations per station. At the moment, this amounts to 92,500 euros per station and per year. And this, this contribution is decided and agreed by the IoT board. So this is a, just a schematic picture that shows you what I just explained with a lot of words before. So here you see all the national consortia. So we have Sweden, France, Germany, Poland, UK, the Netherlands, Ireland, Italy, Latvia. We have the Astron director. Then we have the board, the director, the operational entity that is also uh, making the interface with the scientific community. So when countries join the IT, they get some benefits, of course. So one is to have a seat at the board so they can participate in the decision making of the policies of the IT. They can participate in some joint um, commissioning and early science programs. There is access to scientific and technological collaborations. They also have some reserve access to the ILT observing time and also to the processing resources. Because as you heard from René, LOFAR data requires a lot of processing. So these resources are also um, come uh, with the ILT, uh, it's part of the ILT resources. And the 10% of the time, the station can be used in private mode. This means that the station is actually disconnected from the network and the owners can use it to do the science day and to, to observe what they want to do. There is also support with the maintenance of the station. So this includes uh, telecoms, it includes annual meetings, it includes visits to stations that require. There is also a pool for spare parts that's owned by the IT. So when in your station something breaks, then you will get a replacement for free. Now, how scientists can access the time? So the IT works in a mix of open skies and reserve access time. So uh, there is uh, the observing cycles uh, last six months. So there are two call for proposals every year. There, there are projects that can be single cycle, so they need to start and, and end within a semester. But since last year, we also have long-term projects that last for four cycles. So the consortia that are part of the IIT, they get a minimum amount of hours reserved for, uh, for use uh, of the full network. So to give you an example, this depends on the number of years that the country has been part in the collaboration and to the number of lower stations. As an example, a country that joins today with one of our station will get every semester 32 hours of IIT time. And after the fifth year, this will drop down to 12. So, as you heard before also, we are facing now an upgrade of LOFAR. So there will be, uh, LOFAR will get a new life or a second stage in its life. And the collaboration has grown over the last year, so it started really as a national uh, Dutch uh, project, and now that has become a really a pan-European uh, infrastructure. So the board has acknowledged and has decided maybe the current governance is not the most suitable for the next phase in life of LOFAR. So we are actually now working to prepare an application to become a European Research Infrastructure Consortium, an ERIC, which is actually a legal framework provided by the European Union for uh, multinational European projects. So we expect the application to be submitted in the summer of next year. And well, the good thing of this is, is we think it will provide really a more stable and sustainable governance for the collaboration because the commitment needs to be done at state level. So now a bit about the future of LOFAR. So at the moment there is a um, big radio astronomy facility that is being developed and it's going to be based in Australia and South Africa, the SKA, the Square Kilometer Array. 
So LOFAR, uh, we want LOFAR to stay really at the top and to remain a cutting edge facility even when the SK is going, going to be here. And for this, LOFAR is currently undergoing a coherent upgrade program to reach this goal. So um, there is a stage plan uh, for hardware to be rolled out in the coming years. And I will tell you a bit about more details about this program now. But the idea is that LOFAR 2.0 is going to be complementary to the SKA, especially the low, uh, so the, the, the low frequency part of the SKA. Uh, it will reach lower frequency bands. It will have a higher spatial resolution because it will have larger baselines. It will allow to space for space weather monitoring capabilities. We think it is going to be more agile in many ways. It's located in the northern hemisphere, so it's a, it's a part of the sky that SK will never do. And it's going to be considered as, as pathfinder for SK2, which is a further stage on the SK. So the path towards LOFAR 2.0, as I say, is a coherent program, it's managed at Astrum. But the, the priorities are set by the IT board. All the partners participate in the program. There are different branches that are funded at the moment. And I'm going to briefly tell you about two of the largest programs, projects, sorry. So the new partners at the moment have a really a good opportunity to participate into this program by participating and contributing to the development effort. So it's really a right moment. So the first of these projects is Duplo. Duplo is a Dutch uh, project. It's about uh, 3 million euros to upgrade uh, the Dutch stations. All the ILT partners are also welcome to join, and they are also trying to obtain funding to participate in this upgrade. Duplo will improve the collecting area of the LDAs. It will improve the calibration, as René showed and explained before, there are some challenges with calibration, especially in the LBAs, and will allow for simultaneous observations of LBA and HBA, which is not possible at the moment. So the idea of Duplo is that it's going to deliver a, a data, a legacy data, that is going to be there available for astronomers for the years to come. So there is a really a huge amount of science that can be done. So this is bit of a sketch showing the size of the, of the field. And you can see, see here so many dots, sources, but if you zoom in, you can find that actually each of these little dots is really a science case on itself. So Duplo is really going to provide a great legacy data. The other project is LOFAR for Space Weather. This is a European funded project. Um, almost all the partners in the ILT are part of this project. The idea is to uh, deliver a design that uh, uh, tells us what, what kind of upgrades or what kind of changes do we need to do to the current LOFAR to allow it to be a space weather monitoring instrument together to astronomy. Because this is at the moment not the case. LOFAR is a purely astronomy instrument. So, well, this picture is a bit summarizing all the science uh, in space weather you can do. So actually you can really study in very details, and I think Owen maybe will later show some examples, the sun. You can also study the solar wind by studying the scintillation of compact sources. You can also uh, get some properties of the solar wind. And you can also study the scintillation of the uh, ionosphere. As René mentioned before, the ionosphere is actually um, a disturbance for astronomy. But with space weather, it's actually a matter of research in itself. So lower scientists have studied the ionosphere so, for so long to get rid of its effects, and now we can use it to understand better the space weather. So as I mentioned before, LOFAR for space weather is a design study. But if we manage to obtain the funding to implement this upgrade, it would make LOFAR really the largest and more maybe flexible and versatile uh, instrument in Europe to study space weather because it covers really all the way from our ionosphere to the sun to the solar wind. 
So I'm almost at the end. So here I wanted to show, sorry, this picture that summarizes the really the vari great variety of science that you can do with LOFAR. So we can study really from home to study our own atmosphere with this lining research to the effects of uh, space weather. And they go all the way to the most distant objects like galaxy clusters and so on. So it's really a uh, very versatile instrument. And we expect with the, in the next phase it will become even more. There will be more science coming out of it. So a few take-home uh, messages I wanted to leave to you is basically that LOFAR has really a great variety of science applications. There are novel data processing techniques and analysis. It will remain really a first-class uh, facility even in the next decade. There are new applications like space weather or lightning that are, are really under study and, and will continue to be developed. The LOFAR 2.0 development is happening right now and we are working to make it completely in the next, uh, to have it completely early in the next decade. So the International LOFAR Telescope has become a pan-European facility and at the moment we are really re revising its governance to reflect this evolution. So with this I finish, thank you and I take any questions you might have.